Good morning, everyone. Welcome and announcement. Welcome to uh, the grace and the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Good morning again. And we welcome home to Unity Presbyterian Church. We extend a special welcome to our guests and visitors and invite everyone, visitors and members, to sound the rare in Francis Pads. You will find at the end of the pews. We get to enjoy a coffee break, I mean a coffee hour today, right after worship. So please stay and have a treat and chat with your fellow Unity folks. We have a couple of folks who need to share some information with you this morning. David Fick, Barney Nicosia, please come out to, to the microphone. <laughs> I call your name good, huh? That was really close. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you got it? Good morning. Good morning. I'm here on behalf of the Endowment Committee. The Endowment Committee has funds available annually for grant requests. We evaluate the requests on their merit, how well the proposals advance the Endowment mission to be God's hands and feet in the world and wider community and the feasibility and the accountability regarding the use of the funds. And as a reminder, um, the endowment fund is separate from the operating budget, so it doesn't help with turning on the lights or paying staff. And then the funds from the operating budget are, don't go into the endowment fund. So those two things are very separate. So this year, the endowment committee worked really hard um, prayed a lot, thought, oh, spent hours, two meetings, um, thinking about the grant proposals that we got this year. And so we wanted to announce the awards. We awarded $2,400 to the Hart Food Pantry to assist with the repair of a refrigerator, which we can relate to. Um, we wanted to help them so that they could offer fresh food to people who use that food pantry. And to the Helping Hands Food Pantry, we granted $2,150 for rent for two months so that they could use those funds to buy food and not to have to pay rent. To Joseph's Coat, something that we've supported for decades probably, we granted $2,500 to assist with the purchase of mattresses, bedding, and preteen clothing, meeting those pressing needs. To the Team Philip Foundation, we granted $3,500 to support Team Philip for supplies, for inclusive activities, for training sessions, and to help in their fundraising efforts. To Kindway, that we met through a lunch and learn, we granted $1,500 to help them in the development of a men's transition program for curriculum and for other costs for that program and to Huckleberry House, which we also met through a lunch and learn, $1,000 to support their mission to provide hope, shelter, and support for youth navigating challenges. And to our wider community, the Buckeye Clinic of South, South Sudan, we granted $2,650 to assist with the purchase of medication, supplies, and vaccinations 
in a refugee camp in South Sudan, a very pressing need that they're trying to meet. And finally, $500 for the pastor's discretionary fund through the deacons to assist members of the congregation and friends of the congregation who have a need that may not be able to be met through other means. If you have any questions about the endowment committee, how it works, um, how to make a donation, there are some brochures, there are little cards out in the narthex. Um, you can always ask a member of the committee, myself, Barb Edwards, Bonnie Eckert, Dan Jacks, and Steve Nicosia. Thank you. While I give one of our other uh, folks with a minute permission an opportunity to come on up here, I see Tara's queued up, or, or David. Uh, very, very quickly, just to update you all, our annual craft show uh, that was held last weekend uh, took in $2,405. So uh, we're grateful, yeah, to everybody who helped out. Uh, and especially, uh, especially to Bill Edwards, uh, his sister Susan, and to Barb, who puts up with Bill in, the, in leading up to uh, the craft show, as well as, of course, the scouts uh, and everyone who helped out. I will also share with you guys that uh, from after worship uh, today up till about Wednesday, I am not around. I'm at a, a Presbytery pastor's retreat, uh, as is anyone I would have covering for me. Uh, so if you need anything, don't until Wednesday. Uh, but in the event of an emergency, reach out to your friendly neighborhood deacons. Good morning. Just a quick announcement on behalf of the deacons. We are doing the shoebox ministry again for uh, Reynoldsburg families. Um, there's a list of items that should go in those box in the um, newsletter that comes out electronically. However, there's one correction. We had thought that they should not be wrapped, and then they should be wrapped, and then they shouldn't be wrapped, and the final decision is please wrap the boxes. So um, there's that, and then we will be collecting the uh, mittens and the scarves once we put up our tree again, and then we're continuing to do our helping of the MRDD families. Um, so there are collection uh, envelopes in the pews if you feel like donating to um, the deacons for that. Anyhow, if you have any questions, find a deacon afterwards. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, just uh, briefly to introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Fick. And I grew up going to Brookwood Ch Presbyterian Church and became a member and a deacon there until we formed with a couple other churches around town that um, closed down to form Unity Presbyterian Church, where, where we are all today. And I, I really wanted to say this has been a very welcoming church and for both myself and Eric, and I really want to appreciate, I really want to say I appreciate all that. But the reason I'm here today is uh, not that long ago, Deacon Barb Smoot asked me to take over for her in leading the meals we make and serve for the homeless at Faith Mission Shelter every other month. I was honored by her asking, and I said I would love to do it. So I'd like to take this time to acknowledge Barb and the many who came before her and also the folks that are presently helping with making this mission possible. Thank you. Uh, Barb has been doing this for many, many years, and she has taught me so much about how all this comes together these past few months. I will be forever grateful to her and for our friendship. There are also, there are also others who have helped make this mission possible whom I'd like to thank and also let them know I will continue to appreciate their ongoing help. Dan Jacks and Valerie Banks they do most of the cooking, and it's really a, a neat experience watching them do that. <laughs> and Dan, along, again, along with Tim Stubbs and helping load the vehicles with all the product, because a lot of it is very heavy, and there's a lot of people that just can't lift all that, and they use their vehicles to transport the food down to the downtown shelter, and that's a very important aspect, too, of this. <laughs> we go. 
Sorry, it's my, my watch Eric gave me, it's too big. If I were my little watch, it wouldn't have happened. Anyway, there are also other people I'd like to acknowledge for their help in the past, some of which aren't with us anymore, and those people are Brian Hamilton, Bob Bennett, Ellen's husband, and Tony Montjoy. And then there are several others still with us um, that are unable to come a lot. Uh, Cliff Moore, Bill and Susan Kuhn, and Judy Montjoy, who also still comes when she's able to. It's always good to see her. Um, I'd also like to thank the youth group for their continued interest and help. It's really uh, nice that they want to help. And it's a great mission for the youth to experience. Um, and I think most of us know that all youth mu to par participate must be at least 14 years of age. And um, another person I'd really like to acknowledge is Lucia Dawson. She's there all the time helping. She goes down all the time, and she's also a wonderful participant. Um, last, I'd like to thank the many people from all walks of life that we serve at the shelter. They are all, all, they are all so thankful to us for doing what we do, and they in turn give us a very rewarding feeling. And if I missed any, anyone, please let me know so I can personally thank you. I appreciate all your continuing support. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your kind words, and thank you for taking on this uh, project. Uh, just a quick uh, words, uh, this, this uh, next weekend is the end of the Harvest Table project. Uh, thanks to all of you who signed up to bring food for the boxes. We have, all, they're all covered, 100 boxes of food have been covered, so that's wonderful. Um, and you can bring the food uh, to fill the boxes next, this coming Saturday between 9 and 11 a.m. Just wanted to give you that reminder, and thank you again. Hello. I think that uh, one of the things that is not, we don't prevail upon a power of prayer. Uh, prayer is, is one thing that, that's so powerful, especially when we do it as a group and have uh, more than one person praying. This Friday we are having our Thanksgiving prayer vigil, and you have at the end of your pews at the center aisle these cards, and there are more cards in the back, uh, on the, the back tables in the narthex. What we would like you to do is put down some sort of prayer concern that you have, and then come this and, and turn in the card, and then this Friday, if you can come, uh, please come to the church between 9 and 3, and we will, um, the church will be open, and Nisa Wolf and I will be uh, in the back, and we'll give you a stack of these cards, and you can pray for the, the names on the card, and so people will be prayed for on and off all day, and then also, of course, uh, you have time to pray your own prayers that you have, anything that you have on your heart. Uh, this is a wonderful time for prayer. And uh, like I say, the church is open from nine to four or three. I forgot, Nisa, where are you? Four, okay, nine to four. And uh, you can come and stay for as long or as little as you like. Uh, it's just totally open. The church is available. So please fill in one of these cards so that we have some people uh, to pray. It's a great way to get started, uh, to start in praying for these uh, things on these cards, and then you just go right on into your own prayers. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> I've, read, I've read that I mean that. <laughs> Just wanted to tell you that uh, the deacons are meeting after the service uh, in the fellowship hall to choose which people they're going to buy for for the Christmas project. So after you get your coffee, et cetera,
please go into the fellowship hall. Thank you. Thank to you all for your wonderful announcement. Uh, but not at least, uh, I would first of all like to say thank you to Pastor Andy and uh, Don, I mean Dan, and all other top members of the church for helping me at the time when they heard of my distress. They swiftly came to my cry. And in a very special way, I also thank Barbara, Miss Banks, our sister back there. They were very personal in making the personal donation to me, to University. I thank you all so much. Um, I, where am I now? Okay, we have here. Uh, are there any other announcements? I know where it's happening. Okay, so uh, wait for a minute. So, again, yeah, last one. Oh, yeah, of course. Call to worship. Based on Amos 5 21 to 24. The law says, I hate, I despise your religious celebrations and gatherings for worship. I do not want your offerings and wound even listening to your songs. But let us I mean, let justice roll down like waters and rationers like an ever-flowing stream. Let us worship God in justice and righteousness. Hymn Lord, we praise you, O God. GT 612. Loving God, we see all too clearly the way we feel to honor you and in law. In this time of sanctity, to many of us, grace, cruelty, vengeance, fear, lies, and anger, in call us to a different and better way. Your way, truth, justice, mercy, compassion. Your people's work is not to win. 
covet worldly power, but to keep way to the presence of your kingdom among us. And let justice flow down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, to seek justice, love, kindness, and walk humbly with you, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and welcome the stranger. Recenter our lives in your truth, O Lord, and place our feet in the way of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Time for silent prayer. Reflections, confession. Oh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear and believe this great good news. By the waters of baptism, we are marked, named, and claimed as God's own beloved children, and as bearers of the promise that nothing, nothing in life or in death, nothing we have done and nothing we can ever do can ever separate us from the love of God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, loved, and freed. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. And now, as people forgiven and reconciled to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us forgive and be reconciled to one another as we share the peace we have found in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us exchange signs of peace with our friends and neighbors. have a seat for now. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you going, Em? Back this way. Come back this way. We're not, okay. Hands off the railing and back this way, please. All right. So normally, when we do our children's message, we do something that kind of goes along with Pastor Andrew's message. Today, we're not doing that. We're doing something completely different. What do I have? A potato. And when you go back to Sunday school, in the back hallway, there are 500 pounds of potatoes back there. 500. And so, listen. And so what's going to happen when we go back there is that we're going to work on separating these potatoes to put in the harvest table baskets. When you look at this potato, 
What do you What do you see? What do you have? You do all potatoes look like this? No. What? Tell me. Do they? they well, how are they different, Jerry? Different sizes and different shapes. What else? Okay. M. Different colors. Different colors, right? They can be uh, Isaac. Some are red, right? So when you see this potato, it's something that. Do, who likes to eat potatoes? Raise your hand if you like to eat potatoes. Okay. What's your favorite kind of potato? French fries. <laughs> Sweet potato, you like sweet potatoes? That's a different kind of potato, Emma? Regular. Regular potatoes, okay. <laughs> and so, potatoes are nutritious, and when we're hungry, they fill our bellies, right? But this potato reminds us of something else. This potato, God tells us when we do something for other people, it's like we've done it to them. So when we give our harvest baskets, to other people, it's like we gave the basket to Jesus because when we take care of other people, he said it's like taking care of him. Jerry? What are you doing with 500 pounds of potatoes? I will explain that when we get back to the hallway. <laughs> um, but Jesus wants us to take care, of, take care of people and take care of the people in our community. And that's what we're doing with this, these potatoes and the other food that we're giving to people. We're taking care of the people in the community. All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads and we'll do an echo prayer. Dear God, thank you for the chances you give us to help those around us. Help us, help us to see those opportunities and use them for you. And use them for you. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go back, walking back to the hallway and stopping at the doors.
uh, uh, prayer for illumination for coming in the world. That your word dwelt within us. Reach the, O oh Lord, let your truth reign through the chapter around us. Hold us in this time that your wisdom may shape us to the depth of our immunity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Amos 5, 18 to 24. <laughs> okay, I see. Okay. The Old Testament reading, Amos 5, 18, 24. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone flee from a lion and was met by a bear, or, or went into the house and rested their hands against the wall and was bitten by a snake. It is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light and gloom with no brightness in it. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and green, and green offerings. I will not accept them and the offerings of well-being of your fat, of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The children of God, this morning we will affirm our faith together using the ancient and ecumenical words of the Apostles' Creed. So please rise as you're able. Let us lift our bodies and spirits to the Lord as we profess the faith of the church together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And our gospel reading this morning is from the Good News According to Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Let us listen together for what God's Spirit is saying to the church. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. 
When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other young women came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. I want you to take just a moment and think about a life-changing event that you or someone you're close with has experienced. The birth of a child, the death of a loved one, the phone call from the doctor's office after a test or biopsy, a new job, a new home, a lost job, a bankruptcy or foreclosure, a graduation, a wedding, or the divorce papers being finalized. Something that changes everything. And now think back, past the event itself, to the moments, days, weeks leading up to it, and the feelings of, what, anxiety, anticipation, fear, hope, expectancy, Maybe all of these at once, uh, as well as feelings you might not be able to put a name to. See, we're all familiar with this in-between time. We're all familiar with the waiting, even if we don't like it. I know I, for one, prefer to be doing something to be making progress toward a goal or some sort of resolution, not just waiting for something to happen. But the act of waiting, maybe better yet, the inaction of waiting, forces us to acknowledge, even just tacitly, that there are things, there are events that are totally outside of our control. After all, if it were up to us, that baby would be here already, the tests would be done, and the results in. We wouldn't have to linger in this in-between time. But waiting reminds us that sometimes there's nothing we can do but wait. And what Jesus is talking about in this parable is waiting but not just sitting there waiting for something to happen. It's an active waiting. Moreover, it's a waiting for something that was understood as being long overdue. When Matthew was writing in the early 80s of the first century of the Common Era, Jesus had been gone for only about 50 years. And the expectation was that he was going to be returning any day. In fact, most people had expected him to have returned already. So when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in the 50s of the first century, he was responding to their concerns that they had somehow missed Jesus' return. The church in Thessalonica and Matthew's community of Jewish Christ followers in Jerusalem nearly 30 years later were anxiously aware that they were living in an in-between time. And they needed reassurance, encouragement, and direction. 
And while most of us don't expect Jesus to be coming back like tomorrow, we are still living in that same in-between time as we're reminded every few years when some popular pastor or armchair biblical scholar will claim to have calculated the exact moment of Jesus' return, and then it doesn't happen. And I think it's good to be reminded once in a while that we're still living in the in-between, the time that caused the Thessalonians so much worry, that we are a people still waiting, And yet, I think we're missing the anticipation and the anxiety of those early Christians. Our modern, quasi-scientific interest in Scripture has guided us to try and do arcane mathematics with numbers that are strictly figurative trying to calculate when Christ will return. And we've become so obsessed with that that we miss what Jesus himself says about the return. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. We may not expect that the fullness of God's reign is right around the corner, But we can't forget that we're still waiting. And that the waiting in this case is a very active thing. No one can know when Jesus will return and bring the kingdom of God on earth to its fulfillment. And rather than spending our time trying to figure that out, we're called to live fully in this in-between time to be fully present in the waiting, and to, as Jesus puts it here, keep awake. This is the perfect theme, the perfect message, to move us toward the season of Advent, which begins in just three weeks, friends, on December 3rd. I just heard Becky take a a sharp (laughs) breath in. Yeah, We're only three weeks out from Advent, y'all. The mood of expectant anticipation that we cultivate through liturgy, song, and scripture during Advent is not, I'm going to say this again, we're not expecting Christmas morning throughout Advent. But the promised return of Christ and the fulfillment of God's dream for the whole creation is what we wait for. Advent is a season that reminds us to keep awake. And even while we live fully in the present, to keep our eyes, our hearts, our minds turned expectantly to the future. But in this cautionary parable we just heard, we're reminded that our waiting, our anticipation, is not a passive, idle thing. This time of waiting also calls for some preparation and maybe some foresight. In the narrative world of the parable, the only difference between the so-called wise and the so-called foolish bridesmaids uh, or young women or literally virgins in Greek was that for some reason... For some of them, for reasons unknown, decided to bring extra oil with them. But they all did what was expected of them. They were all where they were supposed to be, when they were supposed to be there, doing what they were supposed to be doing. And they all fell asleep waiting for the bridegroom, who, by the way, was the one who was running so egregiously late. They all woke up, and when he finally arrived, prepared themselves to lead him into his bride-to-be. But the so-called foolish virgins discovered to their dismay that they hadn't brought enough oil to account for the bridegroom's delay. And they find their lamps sputtering out at exactly the moment they had been waiting for. What makes the so-called wise virgins wise 
is the fact that they planned and prepared for the unexpected. They realized that things seldom work out the way they're supposed to, and they brought more oil than they thought they needed, just in case. Now, this is a pretty easy parable to interpret, but a hard one to absorb and be changed by. Obviously, the bridegroom is Jesus, who, again, when Matthew was writing, was already later in his return than anyone had expected. The foolish virgins who had only enough oil to keep their lamps lit until the time he was supposed to arrive are those people whose faith sputtered out when Jesus didn't show up when they thought he should and make everything right. Whereas the wise virgins are meant to be Matthew's community of Christ-following Jews who kept the faith, continuing to trust in the promise of Jesus' imminent return and the eventual fulfillment of all God's promises. With this parable, Jesus, through Matthew, was encouraging people who were beginning to have serious doubts. Matthew's community had been ostracized, cast out of their synagogues, disowned by their families, and persecuted for continuing to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Anointed One, who would return and redeem not just the kingdom of Israel, but the whole world. But Jesus, who had promised to return before that current generation passed away, was nowhere to be seen. Keep the faith, Jesus tells them through Matthew. Stay prepared. No one knows when the sun will return. Only God knows. So stay strong. Stay vigilant. Don't get lazy in your faith. And these instructions, this encouragement, should be just as urgent for us today as it was to Matthew's community. While we may not expect Jesus' return tomorrow, we should always be ready, just in case. (laughs) But the question that begs to be answered here, I think, is what sort of preparation are we supposed to be doing? I think many of us would say, well, we have to read the Bible and follow the commandments and pray and go to church and so on and so on. But if we look back at the warning God spoke through Amos, I don't think any of that is the case. Amos wrote at a time much like our own, when people prided themselves on the rightness of their worship, the correctness of their doctrines, but at the same time they neglected the poor and the hungry and exploited the vulnerable members of their society. And for this reason, God warned the religious people, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, Presbyterians. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God wants justice, not worship. Or better yet, because I like my job, God wants worship only if it leads us to justice. God doesn't care how many verses of Scripture we can recite if they don't inspire and help us to make the world a more just place. As I said, today's readings are easy ones to understand, but hard ones to really take in. 
So let's admit that, as with all waiting, waiting for Jesus' imminent return is hard. It's hard to wait for something when you don't know when it will happen. But let's also recognize that if we take Amos seriously, then opportunities for active waiting and preparation for Jesus' return are all around us. Whenever we work for justice, we bear witness to the presence and promise of Christ. Whenever we bear one another's burdens, we testify to the reality of the body of Christ present as the church. Whenever we advocate for the vulnerable and marginalized, reach out to those who are lonely, or work to make this world that God loves a more just place, we bear witness to the presence of the risen Christ. And it's okay to admit that this kind of waiting and preparation are hard to sustain, especially when we're called to do them indefinitely. We can grow weary in our work, frustrated by an apparent lack of measurable outcomes, or distracted by the thousand and one other obligations that fill every moment of our lives. In short, we can admit that on any given day, each one of us may discover that we are a foolish bridesmaid without enough fuel to get us where we need to go. But as we acknowledge this, let's remember also that the church is a community where we can find help and support in our waiting, and encouragement as we struggle and grow in our faith and discipleship. It's striking that in response to the Thessalonians' concern that they had missed Christ's return, Paul wrote to them, Therefore, encourage one another. This is our role as the church. We are a people who wait for and with one another, the wise and the foolish together. We are those who sit vigil with one another through times of pain, fear, loss, and mourning. We are those who celebrate achievements and console in disappointment. We're those who share hope when hope is scarce, comfort when it is needed, and courage when we are afraid. We are, in short, those who help one another to wait, to prepare, and to keep the faith. In all these ways, we encourage each other with the promises of Christ. That's what it means to be Christ's followers then and now. And that is why we come together to hear and to share the hope-breathing promises of our Lord. And in this way, bear together in the waiting. Thanks be to God. Amen. Children of God, let us rise as we are each able and sing together, Seek Ye First, hymn number 175.
And as those who wait with and for one another, encouraging one another and giving hope where hope is needed, we have the great privilege and the great responsibility of praying with and for one another, rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn. And so I invite you to share your concerns, your needs, your joys and gratitude with this community of faith. And when we hear good news, I will say, Lord, for these blessings, and together let us respond, we give you thanks. And when we hear a cause for concern, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and together let us say, hear our prayer. Uh, I would offer prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude uh, to all of our veterans, uh, thanking them for their service and the sacrifices they have made for all of us, uh, and also concerns for healing and wholeness for all those who suffer from PTSD and are at such a high risk of homelessness and of dying from suicide. We pray for peace and courage, healing and wholeness. And let us pray for the ongoing commitment to build a world where swords are beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, where we all lay down our swords and shields by the riverside and learn and study and practice war no more. So Lord, for these blessings, we give you thanks. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And children of God, for what and whom do you pray this morning? Barb. Thank you. Yeah, we pray for, uh, for young Bentley Barker and his family and loved ones as he goes in for complex heart surgery tomorrow. We pray for a successful surgery, for a quick and full recovery, and we pray for his medical team that they may serve with wisdom, with compassion, and with skill as they seek to work God's healing in his life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Alicia. Yes, we pray for... Uh, Yusuf and his family, uh, he's a student uh, in second grade at Rose Hill Elementary uh, who has an inoperable brain tumor. They found it uh, is inoperable. And so the family is trying to find a way to uh, get back to Algeria so he can see friends and family there. We pray for peace and courage and for comfort and whatever wholeness may look like for them in this moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tara, I saw your hand up there. Thank you. We pray for Tara's friend Brittany and her family uh, who lost their brother to suicide. And we pray for all families that are touched by the epidemic of suicide. We pray for folks who may be considering uh, dying and pray that they may know peace and comfort and the support and love of community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There's Anita. Thank you. We pray for uh, Jim Kleiner and his sister, Connie uh, Barden, who is uh, 
I guess Jim uh, has Parkinson's and is moving into assisted living. We pray that this is a successful and helpful transition and that the change is as easy and non-traumatic as it can possibly be. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Alicia and then Paul. Yes, prayers, uh, prayers for our schools um, and indeed the whole world. Uh, religious institutions are not uh, immune to the epidemic of gun violence, but specifically uh, this week a, a student at our daughter's school was arrested for having a gun on the premises. And so we pray for uh, the political will and courage to do whatever we can do to curb the epidemic of gun violence and for wholeness and peace and comfort for all of those whose lives have been shattered to this epidemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Paul. Amen. And what was the name again? John O'Donoghue, okay. Thank oh, thank you, okay. <laughs> Prayers of thanksgiving uh, for Andrea's mother, John O'Donoghue, uh, where a tumor was successfully removed, and we pray for her continued healing and wholeness, peace and comfort and courage for the whole family. Lord, for these blessings, we give you thanks. And Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And let us raise to God these joys and concerns that have been named, as well as those we name in our hearts. As we join our hearts and voices together, praying the prayer our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And with thanksgiving for the bounty of the earth, the work that we have been entrusted with, the joy of sharing so that others may live, we gather and share our gifts, loving our neighbors as ourselves. And in gratitude for the gifts that we have been given to share, let us lift our bodies and spirits to God. Please rise as you are able, as we sing together the grace of giving, which you'll find printed in your bulletins. us what we need. Indeed, you have given us more than we could ever ask for. Accept this portion that we dedicate to your work. Grant that we might be blessed in turn as we see your reign at work in the world and in ourselves. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing together hymn number 12, Immortal Invisible.
Amen. Children of God, go in peace. Keep awake. Stay alert to the signs of God's presence all around us. And with courage and hope, join in the work that you see God doing in this world. And by your acts of justice and mercy, forgiveness and kindness, Keep your lamps trimmed and burning, ready for the arrival of the bridegroom, that we may all join in that great wedding feast. And as we wait, friends, what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? to seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. So go now in peace. And may the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love and the power of God our Creator, and the communion and community of the Holy Spirit abide with and sustain you each and all this day and evermore. Amen. Amen.